Um, thank you so much for joining us for today's virtual event, Opportunities in Women's Health, a fireside chat congressional briefing with ORWH Director Clayton. Um, my name is Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research, which is a national nonprofit dedicated to advancing women's health through science, policy, and education while promoting research, research on sex differences to optimize women's health. And before we get started on today's conversation, just a few housekeeping items to note. Uh, first of all, this event is being recorded and it will be posted online. So all of those folks who registered are able to access this following when we send you an email. Um, and then if you wanna ask a question during today's event, please use the Q&A function. And if time allows, we'll, we'll ask questions at the end of the event. And finally, if you need technical assistance, you can write that in the chat function. Just note that we do have limited assistance available while the webinar is running. So a little bit today before we get into the conversation about the Friends of ORWH. Um, this event is being hosted by the Friends and the Friends is a coalition that's comprised of organizations representing scientists, researchers, clinicians, policy advocates, patients, and other women's health stakeholders who support the work of the Office of Research on Women's Health at the NIH. And together, these groups are committed to prioritizing sex and gender disparities and needs within biomedical research and within our healthcare system broadly. And if you are here and curious to learn more about the Friends or membership, please visit our website, which is listed here on this slide. And so today we are really honored to be joined by Dr. Janine Clayton. Dr. Clayton is the NIH Associate Director for Research on Women's Health and the Director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, to which she was appointed in 2012. She previously served as the Deputy Clinical Director of the National Eye Institute and as a board certified ophthalmologist. During her time at ORWH, Dr. Clayton has strengthened NIH support for research on diseases, disorders, and conditions that affect women. And among her accomplishments is developing the NIH policy requiring scientists to consider sex as a biological variable across the research spectrum and serving as co-chair of the NIH Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers with the NIH Director. Dr. Clayton, we are so pleased to have you and have the opportunity to speak with you today at such an opportune time. Um, following the announcement of uh, in the fall about the White House initiative on women's health research and in advance of Women's Health Research Day, which is this Thursday, um, I feel like this is a really exciting time to be in, in research on the health of women. Um, and so thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Katie. Excited to be with you today. Excellent. So um, maybe to kick us off, as you're reflecting, obviously, we're, I think we're still saying Happy New Year. Um, as we're reflecting on 2023, um, what were the milestones that you saw in the field? And, and where do you see building momentum in 2024? So I think we all are, are reflective at these transition points. And 2023 was a really busy year for us at Team OWH and at NIH for Women's Health Research. And so I'm just going to start with one of the accomplishments that's related to us in the workforce and interacting with the research workforce, because that's the people who are doing the research that gets the uh, new, new information out there. So we expanded our reach for our interprofessional educational courses, and uh, now over 60 learners from over 60 countries have accessed those courses, and they are the Bench to Bedside course, our SIBB Primer introductory level courses and content that talks about sex and gender. So at every level, we're providing information that's out there um, for the research workforce, for the public, for scientists, for clinicians to understand how important sex and gender are. So putting those resources in people's hands is something that we value as important for us to do. Equally important, we partnered with six institutes and centers to create our second R01, our first R01 was on sex and gender and influence in health and disease, and we also reissued that. But our second R01 is on chronic diseases and chronic conditions that are understudied among women. And we know these are really important. So we're privileged to be able to work with several institute centers and offices and look forward to funding our first applications this year. So chronic conditions understudied among women. We did an R01 our bread and butter grant, as well as an R21, a smaller grant. So that should expand 
um, the realm of folks that can apply to those. We also saw in 2023 the opportunity of elevating key issues related to women's health nationally and internationally. And so I'm sure, uh, as you mentioned, the White House initiative is one thing that's very top of mind, and we'll get a chance to talk about that in more detail. Um, but internationally as well, I'm delighted to share that we partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, formed an innovation equity forum, which is a group of stakeholders from you know over 50 countries, over 200 stakeholders from multiple sectors, and created a women's health research innovation opportunity map. And that map includes 50 opportunities across various sectors and domains, and it's designed to unleash global efforts to implement innovation in women's health and so um, and around the world. So getting an opportunity to work with so many fantastic um, folks who are in that space and trying to move the needle across the globe was something that we were particularly proud of and hope to look forward to working with more uh, folks on in the future. You know that midlife health of women is something that's very important to Team ORWH, and at ORWH, we decided to select that as our theme for last year's 2023 Vivian Pym Symposium, which is our recognition of National Women's Health Week. So we elevate issues in that symposium, and menopause and optimizing midlife health of women, uh, we had a a really fantastic group of speakers across all topics related to menopause and midlife health of women. We had a nice 30-year update on what we learned from the Women's Health Initiative from Joanne Manson from Harvard and many other speakers who talked about what we've learned since then and what the remaining research questions are for today for women in midlife. Um, and so we had also selected midlife uh, health as one of our previous in focus quarterly themes. So we put out a publication every quarter. And so we had a nice um, synergy there between that and, and launched a new website trying to give learners and users an interesting and one point that they could enter the space and learn about women's health research and, and menopause in that context. So you know, I, I could go on and on, but I'll end with some research advances and that those were featured in the biennial report. We just, uh, in the end, that was our last big bang for 2023. We got our NIH biennial report on women's health research published. It's available on our website. In that biennial report, you can see women's health research advances and how the institutes and centers have been addressing sex as a biological variable or SABV um, and addressing the NIH-wide strategic plan. Each institute has their own chapter in the biennial report. In addition, we have a NIH-wide report on inclusion, how we've met our inclusion requirements and the data there showing uh, over half of the participants of NIH Supported Clinical Research are women and they have been for many years, but we also have a little deeper dive if you wanna look at something more specific. We report on the budget there as well as the Women's Health Research Budget at NIH. And we report on the gender breakdown of NIH grantees, as well as NIH employees in the workforce and the scientific workforce. So it's a really robust report that has a lot of information. Um, and and we and so that was available, and we launched a new office. Again, um, autoimmune diseases affect many, many more, more women than men, um, and we are so delighted that Congress decided to uh, create an office of autoimmune disease research within ORWH to address those critical sets of diseases and conditions that are causing. Um, really disproportionate impact on women of all ages and all backgrounds. So we launched that in 2023. Um, and our colleagues apparently think women's health research is also an important topic. So National Academy of Medicine selected women's health as the theme for their annual meeting. And so I was privileged to be there and present along with colleagues. And several other National Academy studies are underway related to women's health. So I would say that we... Uh, really had a banner year in terms of being able to mobilize attention with our stakeholders, like the Society for Women's Health Research, like the Friends of ORWH, like um, advocacy groups and professional societies and others, to be able to say how important women's health is to the health of the nation, to the health of people and societies in, in a variety of ways. So it, it was a busy year, but we're also excited about what 2024 will bring.
Excellent. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I can see questions coming in. Um, we will also share when we send our email with the recording, a link to a lot of the resources and back to the ORWH website as well. Um, I strongly recommend that our audience go to the ORWH website and make sure that you sign up for all of the newsletters and materials that you can receive right in your inbox. They're really helpful and informative. And I would say, having dug into the, the biennial, biennial report that you mentioned, really um, looking at the progress that has been made has been really interesting and insightful. So all, please go check those out and we'll be sure to link those as well so that you have those resources right there. Um, and I think you've covered so much. There's so many things happening and it's kind of all coming together at a time where um, I think it's safe to say that we all agree that, you know, we've made great progress, but there's more to be done. And now is the time to really leverage this conversation that's happening. Um, I wonder if you can touch on at all sort of what ORWH's role is or will be in the new White House initiative on women's health research. Yeah, I agree. It's a really fantastic time and ORWH is playing a leading role on behalf of NIH and working with the NIH leadership as well as the institute and center leaders across NIH on, on this new initiative. Um, this is an initiative that's going to further prioritize the importance and need for more women's health research in the minds of our colleagues as well as in the public eye. Uh, it's really important right now, especially because we know we're in a fiscally constrained environment, and it's more important than ever that women's health be considered front and center from the beginning and not as an afterthought. And so when you have those circumstances, it's critical for those voices to continue to be heard, for us to prioritize and accelerate the research that we're doing because we know sex matters at all levels. We know that gender affects health. We know that the health of women affects the health of societies. Women's health research in and of itself is uh, warrants support and effort, but it is also um, an equity issue and it's an economic issue. And that we know that investing in women's health research from a variety of reports, all these reports have been coming out the last couple of weeks, um, demonstrating showing the data, showing the numbers. When you invest in the health of women, it benefits everybody um, in tangible ways. Um, and so I think that it is critical and we're excited to be playing this role with the White House Women's Health Research Initiative. Having women's health research be elevated at, a, at, that, at that stage, um, kind of the world's largest stage, I think demonstrates how important it is. And so the, the focal points in that initiative, there are 10 different focal points, and we work on all of them and look forward to, to expanding our work um, and partnering with others to do that. But the stated mission of the initiative is to accelerate women's health research in the U.S. And I, I like how it's so crisp and clear what is trying to be done there, um, whether that's assessing the federal landscape so we know better what's happening and also where additional investments could catalyze progress um, or setting priorities that help um, with strategic federal research investments across, um, across the federal landscape in the context of what women need, what are the critical public health needs, improving coordination is part of the initiative as well. We're always trying to partner more effectively across the government and with private sector. So public-private partnerships are part of the initiative, and I'm looking forward to creative ways to do that. Um, we've got a new NIH-wide strategic plan that will be coming out in 2024 on women's health research, so the timing is really great to have these all coming together. And so policy recommendations are part of the White House initiative as well. How we collect the data, how we do the research, making the analysis better um, so that we can understand sex specific outcomes or sex differences as appropriate and accounting for sex as a biological variable from preclinical research through translation and clinical research. Um, and one of the phrases that's in the White House initiative that is repeated is making the research actionable for people. That's why we're here. Turning dis discovery into health is NIH's tagline. It's, it's a nice short tagline and it, it's the bottom line research into health. And if we can't make our findings actionable, or if we have um, incomplete pictures, we're not able to do everything that research could do. So really maximizing 
the impact of research. Health disparities, we know that there are differences in health outcomes for women as a result of our gaps in knowledge and, and making sure that data can fill those gaps, those gaps in knowledge, and that we can uh, take that new knowledge and translate that into improved health of women everywhere uh, from all backgrounds um, and status is an important aspect of the initiative as well. And so uh, identifying opportunities for public-private partnerships, as I mentioned, that's going to be a way to drive innovation. And I think putting the engine of innovation to work for the health of women, you know, our tagline is putting science to work for the health of women. And I'd love to see my partners in the enterprise help put innovation to work for the health of women and have been seeing that in many, many different ways. And I'm excited about that. Disseminating actionable research and data and making sure that federal data sets are available and that they inform care. So we can't have sex and gender aware care if we don't have the data in, for clinicians to make uh, decisions upon with their patients, right? So ex expanding sex as a biological variable, of course, would be something we'd love to see come out of that um, as a one way to make every dollar work harder for the health of women so that we can do research, health research in the best way possible, making it the most rigorous, the most relevant and the most applicable. And so then the last one is around a public awareness. And so events like this go a long way to help the public understand the need for greater investment in and attention to women's health research and what we get out of research investments and how that is such an important way that we can deploy innovations, make new knowledge relevant, and then again, making it actionable. So those are some of the exciting things and, and you'll have to stay tuned for more. And I'm happy to come back when we have a little bit more detail to be able yeah. to share with you. Yeah, I think we would love that. I know the outpouring of support and excitement surrounding that announcement in particular was um, really heartening to see. And I think, um, you know, people are motivated to want to sort of support what is happening. Um, to your point about education and awareness, I, I don't know if you find this, but I have often found that, you know, when I talk to people about what the society does and what we're doing in the women's health research space that um, people say, well, oh, I didn't know that. That's not true. I just assumed, right, that that we knew what we were supposed to know. Um, and so I think, you know, in light of the fact that this week is, you know, Thursday being Women's Health Research Day, which is marking the implementation of the NIH SABV policy, um, which you were integral in that development and, and implementation of that policy um, has, has been really critical in making strides in this space. Where do you see the challenges and opportunities with respect to that policy? It is a really exciting week and it's great to be able to recognize the progress that we've made um, before, you know, and we know that policies make a difference. So inclusion policy, the NIH inclusion policy has resulted in women being over 50% of the particip participants of clinical research. But I recently saw a paper that showed that for the first time, 47% of publications from a particular set of articles from NIH funded clinical trials reported the results by sex, 47%, so close to 50 over 30 years after the inclusion policy went into effect. So it took over 30 years for the policy to result in the information being available to the public through publications. I say that to say that we really hope it's not gonna take 30 years from SABB policy to get the full impact of the policy. We have seen incredible change and we know that um, having investigators, applicants explain why they are choosing a single sex study has changed the way people think about science. We know that having the default be we're studying males and females and we understand that sex may affect the study design has changed the way that people think about science. But we also know that the uptake of this changing perspective has been inconsistent across different disciplines. So one of the barriers is that different disciplines were at a different stage of development related to how they account for sex as a biological variable. And disciplines and scientific um, specialties, uh, they tend to work together within their specialty. And so we don't see as much crosstalk as we would like to see. So interdisciplinary approaches where we could share more lessons learned across disciplines is one thing we'd like to see. 
We're also really excited to see that other countries are looking at how the US, Canada, Europe, and others have been implementing policies related to sex as a biological variable. And um, along with Jamie White and others, um, we published on looking at those policies. And so we've learned something from those policies and we've learned that training is a barrier, that this is not uniformly included in uh, postgraduate education and in graduate school, that research design in particular is a topic that um, is inconsistently included in graduate education. Um, we've also learned, and there's a whole section on lessons learned in that particular publication, that we funding, you know, funders having a policy is one thing, but also conducting the research and then getting the research published and then getting sex specific results in the publications because the journals have policies around that is another. So sex and gender equity and research or SAGER guidelines, you know, we've seen over five years that those have been in, in, in effect by many journals adopting them or similar guidelines, but not all. So again, inconsistent across different disciplines because we're making change. So it's not surprising that when you're trying to shift a culture, in this case, a science culture globally across many different disciplines that you will have um, some progress being made more quickly in some areas than others. And so our goal is to share that, share those lessons learned so we can have more uniform progress and consistent progress across the board. And we know that um, you, you're going to need to address that across the entire enterprise. So system-wide approaches, and we are always seeking to partner with stakeholders in the enterprise so that we can attack this issue from multiple vantage points. We can provide carrots and sticks, and we can support the research being done. And to that end, um, my first program when I became director was the Sex and Gender Supplement Program at, at, at ORWH. And we have given over $40 million and funded over 420 applications, supplement applications, in collaboration with 19 institutes and centers and offices in the, in the 11 years since that program was created. What that did was these investigators were already, already funded by NIH. And they were given additional money to add this perspective, add additional numbers, add uh, another sex. So that influenced the research being done in the entire laboratory and the way that those um, investigators and the trainees in those labs thought. And so we are now seeking to see the ripple effect from those folks that were either now subsequently applying for grants and the publications that have come out of that investment. Um, so, you know, inconsistent uptake, the, the time that it takes for change to occur, the resources required, and we've continued to support, invest in resources that would support changing um, understanding, elevating understanding, education and, and career development. Um, those, are, those are some of the things that we see. And then the, public, the, the publication guidelines vary across journals. Um, so we are seeing improvements and exciting science that's coming out of that, you know, sex differences and how the liver responds to um, different um, pharma pharmacologic agents, because we know women have more side effects than men do. Those are some of the things that are coming out of it, but it, it does take time. Yeah. I mean, we see that as well when we think about sort of changing science and impacting clinical guidelines. So there's there is a long time to make sure that it's as integrated as possible and a part of the learning process. And so um, I want to also say that there's a, a comment here um, that I was also going to make about, um, you know, a, a plug for the, the course that ORWH offers on uh, sex as a biological variable. Um, it's a 30 hour CE course, definitely um, worth looking at for folks who are trying to a, get a better sense of that for themselves, but also as you are teaching new um, folks, new researchers, um, and you have clinicians thinking about this as well, um, young scientists, it's really critical, I think, to make sure that you're learning as much as possible. Um, and to that point, is is there anything, obviously knowing that this takes time um, and that we're making progress, I think we're making really good progress, is there a way that we could better integrate SABV into the research enterprise, at, at least in the US? I know you mentioned the publication guidelines. Those are super critical, I think, to making sure that um, you know, folks are looking at this. Is there anything that, that maybe we could be doing to, to support some of this work from, from the outside? I think that anytime 
you are dealing with health, the conversation around SABV should be part of that from the beginning. So any arena where we're talking about health, health isn't health outcomes are informed by research. So bringing it into the conversation, each and every one of us can bring it into the conversation. If you're touching the health enterprise, you have an opportunity to say and ask questions. Asking questions is a very, very powerful driver for people that you're, um, you're of whom you're asking the question to think about the issue differently. And so we're expanding the mindset and the way people think about that's that was actually the driving force here. Policy is one way to change the way people think. Programs are another way. Our business processes are another. Compliance is another. You know, how we do things is another. But every single meeting um, has an opportunity to incorporate, that's related to health, has an opportunity to, to incorporate a, a message as part of the outcome of that discussion on what do we know about how men and women might be affected differently by this? Do we know? And so elevating the conversation by asking questions is literally something everybody can do. Um, sharing information about, like you just did such a lovely way, thank you, Katie, about the courses and resources available, because they're incredible resources that are available. And we want to make sure that people use them because we've we've all spent a lot of time and effort to create them. And they really give the person additional tools. So they have additional tools because now they understand that a factorial design is something you could use from a design perspective that does not necessarily result in increasing the end, the number of animals in a preclinical study to a large amount. So that puts you in a position to be a sex as a biological variable ambassador and be myth busting. So myth busting is another tool, right? When you hear something, well, I'm going to have to double my end. If you have the information, actually, you might not. Here's some resources. Here's something on experimental design, um, which would give you a tool. So all of us asking questions, all of us serving as SABB ambassadors, wherever we go in our spheres of influence, taking that information, myth busting. And then when somebody um, does have a thought of a new way to do it, sharing that thought, because we are open to new ways to do this. Um, there's incredible um, brilliance out there and the voices of women ultimately are driving why we do what we do and how to get to a way that we're centering their voices, hearing their voices, addressing their concerns and in a way that that improves their quality of life, not, not just uh, lifespan, health span is important as well. I love that. I love that everyone here can can go take this away and be an SABV ambassador. Um, and definitely we'll keep the myth busting going on our end for sure. Um, I know we're running up against time. Um, I want to ask you, uh, what is your you know new year? Here we are um, looking at lots of different exciting things. What's your hope for women's health research in 2024? It's a big, it's a big question. <laughs> That is a big question. My my hope for women's health research for 2024 is once and for all that whenever we think about health, we think about women and we think about sex as a biological variable and how that might be affecting outcome. And that this will be a first thought, not an afterthought. And that we'll work together so that it will be as automatic as looking right or left before you cross the street. Automatic. Okay, what about sex? What about this? What about life course? What about populations of women everywhere? What about underserved settings? What about health equity? What about the life course? What about midlife health of women? That that will be automatic because we're giving the tools for our colleagues to be able to incorporate those conversations. And the promise of that change is that we will understand so much more going into 2025 that we will address what's happening to the health of women in this, in this country and around the world. And we know that there are um, declines in the health of women. And so we've got to do things differently because that is telling us that what we're doing is not enough. And so I think we can work together better across the sectors because the situation is really demanding that we do things differently. And I am looking forward 
to those opportunities for multi-sector collaborations, for identifying needs and addressing them, for um, not working cross for purposes and not duplicating efforts, but being truly synergistic. And I've been using that term, uh, Katie, synergistic science, because I like the S at the beginning for sex and the G in the middle for gender, that when we consider sex and gender together in our innovation, in our translation, in our application, in implementation science, that we make the science better for everybody. Excellent. Well, Dr. Clayton, thank you so much. And on behalf of the friends, thank you for joining us. Thank you everyone for your interest and attention. We had a high, high level of, of interest um, and registrants for this particular conversation. Um, and I, I think the way that you summed this up was so uh, perfect going into Thursday's Women's Health Research Day. Um, make it a first thought, not an afterthought. And um, we will keep repeating that. And again, Dr. Clayton, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Katie. Thank you to all, all right. the friends of ORWH. <laughs> everyone have a great day.